Hi, I'm Andrea Vandenaikoff, and I work at Appleton Partners. I wanted to start off by saying that Mark Appleton gave this lecture in 2016, and I'm honored to be able to share this with you today. This perspective that he came from is quite different from the one that I'm gonna come from. He asked why an aging guy like him should be giving the talk instead of a woman architect. His answer was out of guilt, purely and simply. Well, now a woman's giving this talk. When he entered his graduate architectural class in 1968, they had four women in a class of 35. When he apprenticed in the 1970s at three different offices following graduation, each one of those offices employed only one woman, and that woman was the secretary receptionist. When he began his practice in 1976, he made a resolution to try to hire an equal number of men and women. In 40 years of practice, the firm has managed an average of 53% men and 47% women. Not bad, according to Mark, but he still didn't feel as if he was gonna win any medals. I received my master's in architecture from UCLA in 1993. At least half of my class were women, strong, intelligent, and talented. I joined Appleton in 1997. After two jobs at firms that did healthcare, I was ready for a change and wanted to head towards residential. I asked a friend who had previously worked at Appleton to get me in contact with them to see if they were hiring. Much to my luck, I was hired and started working right away. There were already women working in the office in all positions, which has continued to this day. The culture at Appleton has always been supportive, and while working my way up in the firm, there was never any issues with my gender. I have been able to balance my life as a wife, mother, and caregiver to an aging parent with my career, thanks to that support. When people ask how long I've been at Appleton, I always respond, 23 years and two kids later. The last few years have seen a lot of changes for women, and I look forward to seeing all those changes and more keep pushing forward. When you consider that architectural schools now typically have approximately an equal student ratio of women to men, why is it that the workplace does not reflect this? There are lots of excuses. One of the easiest is the chauvinistic remark that, as a branch of the construction industry, it's a man's world. Another pretty lame excuse is that women may start out in architecture practice, but they retire early to have babies and raise families. I'm gonna guess that it's more than these excuses, that there may be prejudice still at work, which, even if they don't prevent women from joining the profession, still discourage them. Sometimes, in subtle ways, we may not fully understand. Why is it like this? Early 20th century architecture seems to have been all about men, mainly white men competing with each other. Women were largely unrecognized in what was and has long been a male-dominated field. These prejudices persist despite the fact that women are becoming a greater presence in the profession. You only have to look at the controversy around the 1991 Pritzker Prize given to Robert Venturi, with his equal partner of many decades, Denise Scott Brown, having been specifically excluded. The AIA was rightly so embarrassed by this, they tried to save face by finally honoring both Venturi and Scott Brown with the gold medal in 2016. What took them so long? I'm going to talk about four women in California architecture at a time when there were not many women in architecture. They are, in order, going backwards in times from when each was born. Elda Muir in 1906, Luda Maria Riggs, 1896, Lillian Rice, 1889, and Julia Morgan, 1872. I'm only going to be able to give you a brief biographical glimpses of their lives and share only some of their architectural accomplishments. This talk is neither academically researched nor comprehensive. I hope you will consider it a teaser, an invitation to look deeper into their careers. There are many books on this subject, and there are numerous articles as well that have been and are being published about the topic of women in architecture, if you want to delve deeper into their work. If we think today's climate has been a challenge for women, when we go back a century, it reminds us of four pioneering women who, when they decided to practice, faced far more extraordinary odds against them than women do today. The early 20th century was still a time when fundamental equal rights for women were still being debated. Suffragist movement and the 19th Amendment to our Constitution didn't finally prevail until 1920. 
quite a few years after each of these women were born and started practicing. In Julia Morgan's case, 48 years after she was born. To be so alone in attending architecture school, much less actually entering a profession dominated by men, must have been incredibly daunting for them, yet they prevailed. So let's get to know them. Ed Lemure, if she is known at all, is best known for being John Byers' associate. For those of you who've never heard of John Byers, sorry, that's another talk. Muir was born in 1906, and as a schoolgirl at the age of 13, went to work part-time in Byers' office, first as an office assistant. When she graduated from high school in 1923, she went to work full-time for Byers as a designer drafter. In 1934, she became licensed, never having received a formal architectural education or a degree in architecture. That same year, at the ripe old age of 28, she also became Byers' partner. Byers was himself a self-trained builder and architect. He had been a school teacher who taught Spanish and French, but became so interested in construction, especially adobe construction, that he changed professions. Here's a photo of one of his early adobe projects. Here's a sketch of Byers' design for the McLaughlin house. We don't know if Muir drew it, but it's quite possible she may have. Kemper Campbell, Monterey. This image is Macria Ranch House. This home is also in a book Mark wrote on California ranches. This is Byers' own house on La Mesa Drive in Santa Monica, and it's still there. This is the Unitarian Church in a similar style as the Miles Playhouse in Santa Monica. This is a Tudor-style house in Bel Air that Byers and Muir did together. The Gilbert Residence. A house that Muir probably had to do with more than Byers was the Shirley Temple Residence of 1934 on Rockingham in Brentwood. Muir started her own practice in 1946 after World War II. At this stage of her career, she concentrated on designing modern homes. These are some images of the Zola Hall house from 1940. She didn't entirely reject traditional design, as you can see from this image, the Isley House, or the Stossel House of 1966, or the Braverman House, 1967 but she was clearly one of those drawn to the modern movement. This is an interesting article on four women architects from the LA Times Home Magazine from 1957. The cover photos are of Muir's Russell Law House in Malibu, and she was probably the most established of the four architects featured. Mark has been involved in restorations of several of the Byers Muir projects in his career. This is Luda Riggs. Here she is among three other women architectural students at Berkeley in 1920. She's the smaller one, second from the right. In 1918, she had won a scholarship to the University of California at Berkeley by selling the most subscriptions to the Santa Barbara Daily News in a contest. One of her mentors at Berkeley was John Galen Howard, founding chairman of the architecture department and a graduate of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Riggs became an accomplished draftsperson at Berkeley, and when she returned to Santa Barbara in the summer of 1921, she interviewed at George Washington Smith's studio. This is a portrait of Smith. Smith deferred hiring her for a few weeks, perhaps hesitant about hiring a woman despite her skills. So she then went to LA to interview at several firms there, receiving no offers. When she returned to Santa Barbara, she went to see Smith again, and this time he said yes. Riggs quickly proved herself an able employee. Smith and his wife Mary were childless, and Riggs became part of the family, traveling with them to Mexico in 1922. Here are some of the sketches from that trip. Smith's work benefited from her talented hand, and she gradually became quite an important contributor to his designs. These are some of her sketches for projects. Maravella, and Maverick. This is the Libero Theater in Santa Barbara, the design for which she played a key role. Here's her rendering for a City Hall Plaza scheme. While she was working for the Smiths in 1926, she designed a house for herself down the street from them. This house owed a debt both to the Spanish colonial revival style and to her Mexico experiences. In 1928, Riggs received her license, and by 1929, 
Smith began discussing a change in his practice whereby she would become a full partner. In 1930, Smith suddenly died of a heart attack. Riggs and Harold Edmondson, a senior draftsman in the Smith's office, formed a partnership to continue Smith's work, but it failed, in part because Smith had been the one responsible for all the commissions, as well as the Great Depression, which had an impact for all businesses generally. But also, Riggs and Edmondson proved to be incompatible partners. Once on her own, like Edla Muir, Riggs began to steer her practice towards the modernist tendencies, which had begun taking hold of the architectural profession. For a period in the 1940s during World War II, she worked for MGM Studios designing film sets, as seen in this photo. This is the Alice Irving residence from 1951. These are sketches showing the evolution of her design for the Von Romberg house. The design process turned out to be a debate between traditional and modernist forms. In the end, intriguing, although not altogether resolved, I think. Perhaps her most noted work is this project, the Vendetta Temple, from 1954 to 56. It's a wonderful mix of modern, and in this case, traditional Japanese influences. Riggs would continue to practice through the 1970s. She died in 1984, but not before successfully working with the late historian David Gebhardt to donate her own and Smith's office archives to UCSB. Our next architect, Lillian Rice, grew up in San Diego County. She went to the University of California at Berkeley. One can't help noticing a common academic heritage among these women, in that three of them were graduates of Berkeley School of Architecture, and that for Riggs, Rice and Morgan, Bernard Maybeck and John Gallen Howard figured as teachers, mentors, and or employers. As Byers was for Muir and Smith for Riggs, extraordinary men helping these women professionally. Rice graduated in 1910, but stayed an additional year to complete a course in teaching. When she returned to San Diego, she worked for a time in architecture but also taught drawing in school and college. During this period, a new development was created north of San Diego called Rancho Santa Fe on land which was part of the Rancho San Diego Spanish land grant. The development was the brainchild of Walter Hodges, who was vice president of the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad Company. He and Edward Risley, the president, formed a subsidiary the Santa Fe Land Improvement Company to develop a subdivision and sell lots. They hired Leon Sinard as project manager, who in turn hired Requa and Jackson, a noted local architectural firm. Richard Requa had been a disciple of Irving Gill, and he and his first partner, Frank Mead, had helped design downtown Ojai. Two of Requa's books are staples in Appleton's architectural library. In 1922, Richard Rekra brought Lillian Rice on board to be the lead planner for the development, and she moved there to set up shop, pretty much becoming the resident key planner and architect for this new community. This is a site plan of the central village of Rancho Santa Fe. Here's an early 1923 photo of the village's main street, Paseo Delicias. Here's a sketch of the village expressing a sense of expansiveness in the environment. Lillian and her team of three women were also involved in much of the construction, particularly during a local truck driver strike. Clearly, these ladies were hands-on. This is a perspective sketch of the village as the design developed. Rice gave every piece of the village her detailed attention. This was the community gas station. A guest house called La Mirada was designed to anchor the eastern end of the village and to serve prospective property buyers. Here it is constructed. It is now called the Inn at Rancho Santa Fe. Here's a photo of Paso Delicias from the park in front of the inn and a shot looking back at the inn from the distance. The concept of creating a historic village out of whole cloth with enough attention to details that would appear as if it had always been there as a long-established place was not a novel idea. 
Many communities during this period, the town of Ojai among them, were similarly developed during the boom years of early 20th century Southern California. But the charm of Rancho Santa Fe is unique. It owes a special debt to one woman, Lillian Rice. Rancho Santa Fe was Rice's passion, and she devoted her entire architectural career to this one place, designing not just the village, but its schools, as well as many of the private houses in the subdivision. She died of cancer in 1938 at the age of 49, too early, but with an incredible architectural legacy to her credit. So now we come to the oldest and perhaps the most remarkable of the four pioneers, Julia Morgan. Here she is in Paris in 1896, not only the first American woman, but the first woman ever admitted to the École des Beaux-Arts. Having grown up in San Francisco and Oakland, she had already graduated in 1894 with a degree in civil engineering from Berkeley, where she was the only woman in her class and where one of her instructors and a mentor, Bernard Maybach, encouraged her to go to the École. Here's a picture of Maybach from around 1900. Morgan was initially refused admission to the École. They had never admitted a woman before. It was only after two more years and persistence that she was finally admitted and eventually received a certificate in architecture in 1902. This is one of the drawings from the École. Following graduation, she returned to San Francisco and got a job working for John Galen Howard. While at Howard's office, she designed many of the decorative details for his mining building and also designed the Hearst Greek Theater. One has to acknowledge that men like Maybeck and Howard did in fact help these women. But it's also interesting to note that upon hiring Morgan, Howard apparently was heard to say, the best thing about this person is I pay her almost nothing as it is a woman. Pay equity? Still an issue. In 1904, she became the first woman in California to be licensed and opened her own office. Her workload was significantly enhanced following the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. This is her lobby for the Fairmont Hotel. This is what she did for the First Baptist Church in Oakland, 1906. It's impossible to convey the variety and richness in her work. But here's a favorite early project from 1910, St. John's Presbyterian Church. Between 1913 and 1928, she designed 16 structures for the Alzman Conference Center in Pacific Grove. These, among other early projects, owe much to Phoebe Apperson Hearst patronage. She designed schools and a number of buildings for Mills College. This is a girls' school from 1924. She also designed dozens of YWCAs. Oakland in 1915, Hospitality Center, 1919, Honolulu, 1926, Berkeley, 1928, and San Francisco Chinatown in 1930. Notice in all of these the architectural nods to different places and cultures. Sausalito's Woman Club, 1916, Chapel of the Chimes, 1926 Funerary Chapel, and all the urns in the niches. And this is a gravestone from 1928. This is the LA Examiner Building from 1914. It may have been the first commission from William Randolph Hearst. It was by no means the last. As I'm sure most of you know, in 1919, Hearst hired her to begin design on the castle in San Simeon. Here she is with Hearst on the job site. Hearst monopolized her time. How she got all the other work done during this period is truly amazing. This was a huge project lasting almost 30 years. Here are some photos from the project. House A from 1920, the Gothic Study from 1931, the Neptune Pool from 1924, and this is the indoor Roman pool from 1930. 
There's a book called Building for Hearst and Morgan based on the contractor George Lohr's papers and correspondence. It provides a fascinating look at Hearst Enterprise and Morgan's role. During the Castle Project, she also designed a number of buildings for Winton between 1924 and 1937. A Bavarian village retreat for the Hearst near Mount Shasta on the McLeod River. She also, throughout her career, did a number of private houses for many other clients. This is the Gin House in Ojai from 1907, the Chickering House in Piedmont from 1911, the President's House from the San Francisco Presbyterian Seminary in 1920, the Goodrich House in Sarasota, also 1920, the Kennedy House in Palo Alto from 1921, and an interior from a house in Pacific Grove. Morgan practiced until she retired in 1950. Her output was astounding, over 700 completed buildings in a 40-year span. To give you a sense of the magnitude of this, it was more than Frank Lloyd Wright accomplished in 66 years. I love this picture from 1928 of Bay Area architects, all posed in Julia Morgan's office. Bernard Maybach is in the white coat with a white beard in front. Morgan's in the way back wearing a black hat. I stand in awe of all four of these women, but especially Morgan and her accomplishments as an architect. The AIA Awards Program goes back to 1907. In a fair and just world, she would have been awarded the gold medal in 1952, the year after it was awarded to her teacher and mentor, Bernard Maybeck, and the year after she retired. It took the AIA until 2014, 62 years later and 57 years after her death, to finally honor her with the gold medal. Unforgivable. If you don't know much about her, buy and read the books on her work, go look at her buildings. She is a truly great architect and deserves to be in the company of the best of the great men whose architecture we revere. It's amazing to see the story of these four extraordinary women who succeeded in spite of the prejudice against them. We should all work to make the architectural profession a more fair and receptive one. It shouldn't be that hard. In order for this to happen, attitudes need to change. And I look forward to being a part of that. Thank you for joining me.